If you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Let me read verses 5 through verse 9. Hebrews 2, 5 through 9. That's our text this morning. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, put everything, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. We're in the middle of our series in the book of Hebrews, and we're doing, intentionally doing small chunks at a time. This is week four, and we're only on the fifth verse of chapter 2. So we're going to be in this book for a while. But if you've started reading the book, if you started meditating on the book, you realize that there are a lot of things in this book that are just plain hard to understand, right? There's a lot of stuff that are, there's imagery here. There's Old Testament stuff in here that don't relate to us at all, that don't relate to our church, our culture. So my job up here and our jobs as uh, teachers is to help you understand it, to kind of explain the context, the settings of why this writer was writing to this group of people, and to help us understand what he's speaking to us. So today I want to start with asking a question. What did Jesus come to do? What did he come to do? What, What was his purpose in showing up? People have all sorts of ideas on how to answer that question, right? And there's a lot of answers that can be given. We can say that Jesus came to teach, which he did. He has some incredible teaching. We can say that Jesus came to heal, which he did. He's done incredible miracles of people that um, otherwise would never have been healed. We can say that he himself said that he, he came to serve and not to be served. We can say that he came to save us from our sins, to forgive us of our sins, to give us entrance into heaven to give us access to God, to give us a relationship with God. All of these things Jesus accomplished and opened up to us because he came to the earth. When the Bible talks about what, what Jesus came to do, there are multiple facets to it. There's all sorts of stuff that we could say. All of the answers I gave you are correct. But there's one aspect of what Jesus came to do that we often fail to understand. And our text this morning brings that aspect to the forefront. It's probably something that a lot of us have probably never thought about or something that we haven't meditated on a lot. It's the topic of restoration. Jesus came to restore. He came to change things, right? He changes us because of the change in us. God uses us to change culture, and he changes the world. He ultimately begins to change everything. He saves us. He redeems us. So when we talk about salvation... There are three aspects of salvation that we need to understand. Three things about salvation that we need to understand. These are theological words that you've probably heard in maybe songs that we've sung or in Bible studies or whatnot. But they're, fully, they're hard for you to understand or hard for you to define. But it's important for you to understand these three aspects of salvation in our own lives as well as as we study the book of Hebrews. There's three aspects. There's the past aspect of salvation. The Bible calls that our justification. We have been saved. You guys have heard the question, have you been saved? Have you you accepted, past tense, Jesus as your Savior? In theology, we call that justification. At this time when you commit your life to Jesus, you ask him to forgive you. You recognize that Jesus is the Lord of your life. At this point, God has changed your standing with him. You are saved here from the penalty of sin. That's important for you to understand, that you are no longer going to be judged for the sins that you have committed. You have been justified before God. You have been made right before God. You've been saved from the penalty of sin. That's the past aspect of our salvation. But there's a second aspect. That's what's happening in us currently. God is doing something in us right now. The Bible calls us calls that being sanctified, our sanctification. It is being saved from the power of sin. The past aspect is we're saved from the penalty of sin. 
Now we're being saved from the power of sin. Where sin used to have dominion over us, now God is saving us from the power of sin in our lives. God's changing us. He's making us more like him. He's making us holy. He's making us more like him in our affections, in our desires, in our will, in our emotions. We're being changed from the inside out. We're becoming more like him. Listen, we're not like him yet, right? We still struggle. We still struggle on a daily basis with sin, but God is daily working in us to make us more and more like him. We are being sanctified. But there's a future aspect of salvation. There's something that will happen to us. You've been justified, you're being sanctified, and you will be glorified. Glorification is the idea that you are saved from the presence of sin. Right now, every day, you face sin. Sin is in you, sin is around you. But there is coming a day where there will be no more sin. You will be set free from the power of sin in your life. You will be glorified. It won't be around us, it won't be in us, it won't even be in the world anymore. It will be completely destroyed. See, if you apply this to your life, it changes you, it transforms you. You're saved from the penalty of sin. You don't have to worry about is God going to judge me for what I've done? I've been saved because I've been justified because of what Jesus did. You are daily being sanctified. God is daily working in your life to make you more like him. And while we struggle, we have the hope that one day we will be glorified. Sin will no longer reign. Sin will no longer have dominion. But sin will be destroyed completely. And when it comes to the book of Hebrews... The writer almost always deals with this future aspect of our salvation, that one day things will be different. He's already talked about this in chapter 1. In chapter 1, at the end, he talks about how Jesus is going to be exalted and how all of his enemies are going to be under under his feet. And in our text today, he's going to talk about almost the same thing, but not that Jesus is exalted, but because we are in him. Because we belong to God, because we are now a part of the body of Christ, there's going to be a day that we are going to be exalted as well. You will be exalted just as Jesus was. You're not going to become God. That's not what the writer is saying. You're not going to become part of the Trinity or something. But you will be exalted. There's a status that you will receive when the new earth is created. And it's important that you understand that when we talk about this great salvation that the writer talks about, that we looked at last week, the writer is going to explain in our text this morning just how great this salvation is, just how incredible this salvation is. What all did Jesus come to do? Is it just to forgive me of my sins? Is it just to give, get me a get-out-of-jail-free um, card so that I can go to heaven, not to hell? That's a part of it, but that's not all of it. There's a much bigger aspect for it, that he is going to give, um, give us identity and a status in the new earth that it's a place where God is going to restore all things back to the way it used to be. The new earth is going to be better than it used to be. It's going to be an incredible place. And we're going to have a place of authority in this new earth. This morning, regardless of where you stand on what the Bible teaches, whether you accept it as the literal word of God or whether you say that there's good truth in it or wherever you're coming from, all of us this morning can agree that this world is messed up, right? All of us can agree that this world is not the way it should be. Things aren't right. Things aren't right with us. We struggle. We're weak. Our bodies fail us. Things are broken. Something's not correct. And that's where the gospel story comes into play. A lot of times as Christians, especially if you grew up in the church, you've missed some aspect of the gospel message. You miss the totality of it. If you take the entire Bible story, and you break it up into four parts, you'll break it up like this. There's creation, where God creates everything. Then there's the fall, where we screw everything up. Then there's redemption, where Jesus comes and redeems us. But then there's a final aspect of restoration, where God restores everything to the way that it should be. That's the part that we often miss. We miss the restoration aspect. We fail to really think about it and understand how important that is to God and how it even changes our life today when we believe it. So the question that I ask is, why does this writer, the writer of Hebrews, focus so much on the future aspect of our salvation 
When all of the other writers, Paul and Peter and the others, are more concerned of our past or present aspect of our salvation, why is this man focusing so much of what's going to happen to us? Why does this man always point to the future? We've talked about this before, but it it goes back to understanding the context of where these guys were. Remember their life? These were a group of believers, a small group of believers, gathering in a small church in the city of Rome, in a culture that has kicked them out. They're not a sanctioned religion from the government, so they're marginalized, they're persecuted. We'll find out in chapter 10 that their property is being taken from them. Their friends and Jewish family members have rejected them. They're isolated, they're persecuted. Imagine their scenario. Trying to cling on to their faith in Jesus in a very difficult world. The writer is trying to get them to see that that this is not always going to be this way. It's not always going to be like this. This is not the way it was supposed to be. It's not the way it's going to be. There's hope. He's trying to get their eyes on what Jesus is going to do in them and through them. And that's where power comes from. There's, this is where power comes to go upstream in a culture where everything is going against, against you. How great is our salvation? How great is the salvation that we've been given? What's so great about it? As these guys are reading what the writer is saying, they needed to be reminded, just like we do, why this salvation is so incredibly great and why we need to put our anchor down and cling on to Jesus. They needed to be reminded that Jesus was bigger and better than anything the world had to offer, just like we do. They needed to be reminded that whatever temptation the world allures you with, that what Jesus offers is so much greater. So the writer reminds them, cling to Jesus. Drop anchor in Jesus. He will make sure you make it through. Our text this morning shows us four things that I want to look at, four things that I want us to meditate on. First of all, who we were meant to be, who we were meant to be. Secondly, how we screwed it up. Third, what God did about it. And finally, how do we benefit from it? Who we were meant to be, how we screwed it up, what God did about it, and how we benefit from what God did. Pretty simple outline. Let's look at it together. Who we were meant to be. Have you ever thought about that? Who were you meant to be? Who were you created to be? That's what the writer is going to talk about here. The answer to that question will actually shock some of you. Contrary to what people teach in our academics, we didn't happen by chance. We weren't filth that evolved into man and then eventually evolved back to filth again. That's not how we were created. That somehow, that right now, we're at the pinnacle of what we will ever be. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible actually says that we started at the pinnacle. Then we evolved down. We destroyed ourselves. And eventually, we'll go back up. That it's completely opposite of what the world teaches. The Bible says that one day we were kings. But now we're servants and slaves. But because of Jesus, we will be kings again. It's the opposite. That right now, instead of being at the pinnacle, we're actually at the bottom because of where we're at, because of sin. But eventually we will go back to the place where God designed us to be. We were kings, now slaves, but we will become kings again. Look with me at verse 5. Verse 5. For it is not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. The writer's here looking to the future and where we're headed. He's saying God's not going to give kingship to angels. The implication is that right now, angels rule. Right now, it's angels that have dominion. Right now, they do God's service. Right now, they're the messengers of God. Right? We saw this in the previous chapter. They're the ones that are sent to serve. They're the ones that are being dispatched by Jesus into the world. We are recipients of that service. It's not like we can command the angels to show up and do what we bid. They show up when Jesus sends them. We don't have much activity or control of how they do their business. We are recipients. We see it throughout the Bible that angels have dominion over the earth. We see it in passages in, like in Daniel where he talks about angels as princes over certain regions of the earth. 
We see the same hierarchy among demons. The demons have the same hierarchy. That Jesus refers to them as rulers of this world. Paul talks about how we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against rulers and principalities, right? There's a warfare that's going on in the spiritual realm. But who was supposed to rule it? What was, who was supposed to take charge of it? It says here that it's not going to be this way in the future. By implication, that means it wasn't this way in the past. There is a conflict, but who was supposed to rule over it? The answer to that question, it was supposed to be you and me. It was supposed to be us. That was the original design. We will one day rule over it again, but we don't right now. This is why salvation is so valuable and so great. Because in that salvation, we are destined for something so much bigger than us. We're destined for all of creation to one day be put under our subjection. It will one day serve us completely for our joy and for God's glory. God's ultimate intention is to have his kingdom ruled by redeemed men and redeemed women. Practically, for this little church in Rome, it means that these insignificant people we're going to rule everything one day. Think about how that made them feel. Think about their condition here. They felt anything but rulers, right? They were slaves. They were beat down. They were rejected by culture, by family, by friends. And yet the writer is telling them they will be rulers. What they're going through now is not the way it was supposed to be or the way it will ever will be. So God's not going to use angels as messengers and rulers and dispatchers? He's going to use us instead? Where do we get that from? Where do we see that? Look at the next verse, verse 6. He goes back and quotes Psalms, Psalm 8, and he writes this verse. He says, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels, you have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. The writer looks back at the psalm for proof that this was the designed intention for mankind. In doing so, he goes all the way back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And in the psalm, David marvels at how man was made just a little bit lower than angels. Yet he was crowned with glory and dignity by God's design and purpose. Man was made ruler over all of God's creation. That's the way it was supposed to be, right? That includes angels. It includes um, animals. It includes the earth. He has been given position and power and authority over everything. Go back with me to the garden. Go back to Adam and Eve. Adam's kingdom was vast. His territory was wide. His dominion was over land and air and sea. Mankind was supreme. Creation was subordinate. There was superiority and submiss submissiveness, and it worked in perfect harmony. There was innocence. There was loveliness. There was beauty. There was paradise. Mankind was called to cultivate, to care, to nurture. Mankind was called to rule over it. Think about it. As an example, God brings all of the animals to Adam and says, here, name them, right? Have you ever thought about that? Here's God telling Adam to name the animals. Why would he do that? Is it because God had a brain freeze and didn't know what to name these people? Was it because God didn't know what to name them? As if God didn't know what to call them? Why did he do that? God didn't need any help from humanity to know what a camel looked like or what a cockroach looked like. He didn't need humanity to tell him. God perfectly understood what they were, right? He's God. He could have named them. He could have made this big list and given it to Adam and said, here's what you're going to call him. But he wants Adam to be creative. He wants Adam to speak something out of nothing. Where there was no name, Adam was supposed to give a name. He was exercising the authority that God had given him over creation. That's who he originally was. He was a king. He ruled. He ruled the garden. But it wouldn't last. Not sure if you've noticed or not. Just walk outside. But it's not quite that way anymore, is it? That's point two. 
Here's how we screw it up. Look at verse 8. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Here's probably the greatest understatement in the Bible. At present, we don't see everything subject to him. Here's a commentary that the writer is writing on Hebrews 8. Why not? Why isn't everything subject to him? You'll see it go back to Genesis again. You go to Genesis 3 and you see what happened. You find out how we mess it up. What happened? Selfishness meets impulsiveness and we compromise. Selfishness meets impulsiveness. We compromise. Like Jack and Jill, we tumble down the moral hill and we lose our crown. The irony of it, we thought we were going to gain control by doing this. We sinned. Adam, as our representative, threw this world into chaos. They chose self over God. They had a strange feeling come over them at that moment. They thought something magnificent was going to happen to them when they took a bite of that fruit. But instead of a dream, they got a nightmare. Instead of light, they got darkness. Instead of love, they got shame. Instead of joy, they got sadness. It worked completely the opposite. They had their eyes open just like Satan said they would, but not like they expected. They looked around them and strange things began to happen. Animals began to run away from them. Death started to occur in the animal kingdom, and they were frightened. There was a chill in the air. They had always been naked, but now they realize they're naked. They didn't want anyone to see them. They didn't want God to see them, so they run and they hide. And the result was that everything began to unravel. Everything began to get undone. Everything would die even though it was supposed to last forever. They would be removed from their thrones over creation. And now instead of creation being subject to them, they were now subject to creation. We feel that, don't we? Here at the scene was the birth of disease, decay, and destruction, and disaster. Insects and other creatures are now annoying pests, where they used to be under subjection of humanity. They weren't originally created to be pests. Our rule over the animal kingdom is superficial at best. We kind of achieve it by intimidation, don't we? You either obey me, or I will eat you, or I will wear you. It doesn't always work out that way either. Sometimes we become the meal. A mouse can have some of us yelling for our lives and climbing on top of tables. A mouse. A little mosquito can actually kill us. Even our own pets bark back at us. It's a sad predicament. Life is not the way it was supposed to be. Nature itself has become destructive with floods, earthquakes, droughts, famines, and other natural disasters. We plant, but we're unsure if we will reap. We build cities, houses, dams, and monuments that are subject to collapse in an instant by an earthquake or destroyed by a fire. We are not rulers over this world. This world rules us. Nothing we do actually lasts. We are masters of nothing because sooner or later we will lose any bit of power that we have. You may say, hey, listen, I have power. I've got people that do exactly what I want me to do. Some of us call them our kids, right? Um, uh, we have people that do exactly what we tell them to do. That you have a certain command and authority, but you don't actually. Because ultimately, if you're going to lose that authority, you don't have it at all. It's called death. Death trumps everything. It triumphs over each of us. It strikes babies. It strikes teenagers, it strikes young adults, it strikes midlifers, it strikes old people. It laughs at our medicines, at our vitamins, at our surgeries, at our diets, at our exercise programs. When it's all said and done, it will strike every single one of us. Rocket scientists die, politicians die, doctors that are called to save lives will die, Professors will die. Nobel Peace Prize winners will die. The rich will die. The poor will die. The good will die. The evil will die. The banker will die. The farmer will die. Yes, the farmer and all of us will die. Carpenters will die. Computer programmers will die. Students will die. Pastors will die. We will all die. How about that for some encouragement this morning? 
John Piper says it this way, death is not subject to man, and therefore nothing is ultimately subject to us, because it's only a matter of time before it will be taken away from us, and what we thought we had mastered will be ripped from our hands. Listen, that's not the way it was supposed to be. If sin had not entered the world, we would be kings and queens today. But sin did. And instead, we are now beggars living in borrowed time. We who should be free are bound. We who should be kings are slaves. We're not meant, we are not what we're meant to be. But if our story ended there, there's no point in us gathering. There's no point in us trying to live moral lives. But by the grace of God, that's not how the story ends. Listen, you may have a hard time believing that things will be different. All you've known is this, right? All you've known is struggle. All you've known is difficulty. All you've known is pain. All you've seen is death. All we've known is slavery and bondage and destruction all around us. Generation after generation, this is all we've seen. The fact is, this is not ultimately the way that it will be. It's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way that it will turn out to be. How's it going to change? The answer doesn't come from politics. Washington will not figure out the answer for this. The answer won't come from medicine. It won't come from education. The answer comes from a person. And that person is Jesus. That leads to our third point, what God did about this. Look at verse 9. But we see him, him, who is Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. But we see Jesus. After all of that has been explained, after all the power and authority that we should have had been taken from us, after now being subject and slaves now, but we see Jesus. In Jesus, not only is God's original intention achieved, but in Jesus, his ultimate intention is achieved because the second Adam now takes stage and he does what the first Adam could never do. Here's what the writer is saying. He's saying, go back to Psalm 8. See, if we go to Psalm 8 and we read it without any commentary, we'll think that the writer is talking about us, that he's talking about humanity. But this author is saying, no, he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus here. Insert Jesus into the text. He is the Son of Man. He's the ultimate Son of Man. He's the one that fulfills everything that the psalmist is celebrating regarding man. Look at it again. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him, you made him, who? Jesus, for a little while lower than the angels. That's crazy considering what we talked about when we talked about the angels. Jesus, who now dispatches angels to us, who now sends angels to minister to us, for a little while becomes lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything under his subjection, but for a little while you've made him lower than the angels. In other words, we don't see Psalm 8 fulfilled in us yet, do we? We see Psalm 8 fulfilled in Jesus. We are still subject to death. We still suffer. We still are weak. But Jesus has conquered death. He's conquered our weaknesses. He is at the right hand of God. And all of his enemies are now under his footstool. How did he do that? The passage tells us he was made a little lower than the angels. What does that mean? That's his incarnation. The incarnation of Jesus. That's when he became man. Imagine that with me for a second. I don't know if you've ever thought through the incarnation. But imagine the day before Bethlehem happened. The day before Jesus shows up. The day before God becomes man. Constant adoration from angels. Constant affection from the Godhead. In the place of ultimate satisfaction and beauty and delight. And then, bam, you wake up, right? Where do you wake up? In a stable with a stench of manure. You're held by sinful man with dirty hands. Instead of being wrapped in royal linens, you're wrapped in a dirty blanket. Instead of being seated on a throne, you're now being laid in a little basket where animals eat from. Instead of the beauty of angels, 
you get shepherds. Dirty, stinky, smelly shepherds. Where you now are subject to the elements of life. You feel cold for the first time. You feel uncomfortable for the first time. Instead of looking down at creation and being in control, you're now looking up at it. Completely different. He becomes man. Have you thought through that? Godhead is now subject to everything we suffer. But that birth doesn't fulfill Psalm 8 at all. That's only a part of it. It says here in verse 9 that Jesus tasted death. He tastes it. doesn't mean he took a little bite of it like I took a bite of a piece of cake. It's a Hebrew metaphor to say that he completely was consumed by it. It points to the harsh reality of Jesus' violent death on the cross. It actually highlights how brutal his death was. To taste death is to die. You can't take a little bite of it and just be okay. He took all of it in. I want to take you with me for a moment on a journey to the cross. I want to show you what happened there, what it means when we say Jesus tasted death. If you want to close your eyes and imagine this scene, go ahead and do it. But I'm going to give you a little commentary, a play-by-play, if you will, as if you were there. Imagine you're in the crowd That day, you see Jesus coming your way. He's stumbling. He's already half dead, unrecognizable as a human being because of the beatings that have already taken place. You see the guards run up to him, laughing at him, ripping his robe from his back. In doing so, they rip the skin off and the scabs from his back. The wounds are ripped open. The blood is all over his back. Then you see this man named Simon come and carry a part of the cross. They get to the place. The cross is placed on the ground. Jesus is not just gently laid, but he's thrown on top of the cross. The soldiers drive a heavy square nail through his wrist deep into the wood. Jesus lets a screeching, painful cry out as the hammer strikes one, two, three. The soldier moves to the other side, does the exact same thing to the other wrist, to the other wrist, striking it one, two, three. The soldiers then place Jesus on a long beam that puts him from the from his back all the way down to his feet. They mount the two parts of the cross together. Then they take the left foot, put it on top of the right foot, and what both feet extended, toes down, and nail is driven through the arch of each. Jesus is now completely fastened to a piece of wood. They now lift him up and drop him into a pre-dug hole. And as the cross drops into the hole, the full weight of his body is now supported by the nails in his flesh. And now his body begins to stretch. The jolt of the drop and the weight of his body would have separated all of his bones and thrown them all out of joint. Excruciating pain begins to shoot through his fingers, up his arms, and explodes throughout his body. Jesus has never experienced pain like like this before. And as he pushes himself up to avoid the stretching torture in his arms, he places his full weight on the nails on his feet. The tension of his muscles shifts from his hands to his feet, meaning now that cramping begins to start to take place. Now because of the cramps, he's unable to push himself upward anymore. Hanging by his arms, air can only now be inhaled, but it cannot be exhaled. Every time he tries to lift himself up, his back begins to, um, still raw from the flesh, begins to slide along an old wooden cross, splinters and all. His flesh is now scraped into the wood. Death is settling in. The pain of his chest increases. He can barely breathe. It is there where he suffers, and it is there where he dies. That's what the writer means when he talks about Jesus tasting death. That's tasting death. That's what it means to die. He tasted it for you. He tasted it for me. 
he accomplished the work that God had given him to do. And what did Jesus get as a result? What does our passage say? He died, was buried, rose again, ascended into heaven to the applause of the angels. The Father is there to welcome him, receives him. The crown Jesus now wears on his head is the crown that we had lost. He achieves it. He puts it back on. And that leads to our final point. What difference does it make? How does it benefit me? Obviously, on one hand, we recognize that when Jesus died on the cross, it enables us to be restored into relationship with God. But the practical ramifications are so much more for your life right now. Our great salvation is this, is that we are united in Christ. We're united in Jesus. You see this in the writings of Paul over and over. He writes that we are in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. What happened to him happened to us. Therefore, the fulfillment of Psalm 8 is for us as well. Because he tasted death for us, we can also be sure that we will also rule with him. In short, Jesus' death guarantees our future reign. Now, no angel will ever get this. Where's that in the Bible, you say? Jesus said it was the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Paul writes that God made us alive with Christ, raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places. In 2 Timothy, we read, Paul says, if we endure, we will reign with him. Revelation 3, the one who conquers, he will sit on my throne. Revelation 22, we will reign forever and forever with him. You see what Jesus did? Where we used to be kings and destroyed it, he's now restored us. He has brought us back to where we should be. He has brought us back to the status as kings and queens of God. It will one day be realized. It will one day be seen. Where the first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. Where the first Adam lost the kingdom, the second Adam regained the kingdom. With the first Adam, paradise was lost. The second Adam, paradise was regained. When you become a follower of Jesus, when you are identified with Jesus, here's what happens. Since God treats you as Jesus and Jesus as you, you are united with him. When he was crucified, you were crucified. When he was buried, you were buried. When he was raised, you were raised. Now you are exalted with him. And as a result of this, we will have this new earth to rule like we were intended to do back in the garden. This hope of King Jesus ruling and delegating authority in the new earth brought a whole new aspect of hope to this group of believers that were struggling. You've got to imagine what this means for this group of people. This means that there will be no more injustice. This means that there will be no more corruption. This means that they, all these guys have ever seen was corruption, right? This means there will be no more racism. It means there will be no more racial profiling. It means there will be no more cutting corners and, or people taking things away. It means there will be no more poverty. There will be no more homelessness. There will be no more killing of children. All of these, real, all of these things will be swallowed up in the new earth. They feel like slaves right now. They feel hopeless right now. They feel beaten down. They feel persecuted. They had everything taken from them. And the writer is telling them, this is not the way it was supposed to be. This is not the way it will be. Have hope because of Jesus. Can you imagine how they felt when they read that? We're kings. We're queens. We will rule. There is, there is reason to hope. There is no more reason to complain. It gives us all of the more reason to endure. It gives all of the more reason to trust Jesus. It gives all of the more reason to put our anchor down. This great salvation is incredibly awesome. What shall we do? How do we respond? Number one, we put our faith in Jesus. In the promise of future grace, this great salvation You will see Jesus someday come back and set all of this up. You fix your eyes on Jesus, not on the pain, not on the futility, not on the frustrations, not on the sickness, not on the death, 
You fix your eyes on Jesus. All of these things will not have the last word. Jesus conquers death and all of sin and the pain that leads to death. So we should consider him. We should reflect on him. We should turn to him. We should repent to him. We should keep our eyes on him. Practically speaking, this means that whatever you're going through this morning, whether it's pain whether it's disappointment, whether it's persecution, whether it's temptation, you should speak to it. When you are tempted, when disappointment occurs in the face of death itself, you can say, Psalm 8 is my destiny. Psalm 8 is my destiny. In Jesus, all things will one day be restored. Everything will be under my feet, including you, death including you disappointment, including you temptation, including you Satan, you will all be under my feet. Not because I am great, but because Jesus is great and because I am in him. And now I get to inherit all of these things. You get to say that. You believe it because Jesus is for real, because Jesus made it true. You've got no reason to be enslaved to anything. Maybe this morning you're struggling with temptation and you're struggling and you're addicted. But listen, Jesus is greater. He's better. You have no reason to be enslaved to sin. Sin is not your master. Jesus is. Here's how Paul talks about it, and we'll end with this. Think about these words. Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn you? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No. Or distress? No. Or persecution? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or danger? Or sword? No. As it is written, for your sakes, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what challenges you're going through. I do know that this writer was writing to the church, life was hard for them. Probably a lot more difficult than what we will ever face. Life is a difficult journey, isn't it? But he's writing to encourage them. He's writing to encourage you. Listen, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it is today, you can have hope. That what you're going through today is not what you were destined for. It wasn't what you were created for. But because you are in Jesus, you will be restored. For some of you, it means you go through hardships your entire life. But you can have hope. Because we weren't created to simply live 40, 50, 60 years and then die and decay away. We're created to be rulers and kings and queens in the new earth. You can have hope that no matter what you go through, no matter how hard the challenge is, no matter how hard the difficulty is, no matter how hard your marriage is, no matter how hard your finances are, no matter how hard life is, you can have hope. This morning, let me encourage you as we come to the table that the only reason we're here is that we should have destroyed ourselves. We should have had no hope. But because of Jesus, we are now rulers again. You might not feel like it. 
you might say the last thing I have is authority. But there's something about not going according to your feelings, but according to what the word of God says. Because that never changes. The word will never change. We are kings. We are queens. As we come to the table, we recognize we're not kings because we deserve it. We're not queens because we've earned it. We've been, we are because we are in Christ. We are because of what Jesus did for us. So I invite you to meditate on the cross for a few moments. Imagine that scene again of the suffering that Jesus went through. Recognize that he did it for you. He did it to redeem you. He did it to rescue you. He did it to restore you. And as you come to the table, would you come with humility? Knowing that you have nothing to boast. Knowing you have nothing to say. But you come recognizing, Jesus, this is your work. I come to the table in an act of worship, recognizing that I need the gospel every single day. I need you every single day. Father, this morning as we have heard, you restored us. What a great salvation. And even while we're struggling today, even while we're going through hardships today, we know that this is not who we are called to be, but you have designed us for something so much bigger. And our hope is not in our present situation. Our hope is not in one another. Our hope is not in our accounts. Our hope is not in our degrees or our education. Our hope is in Jesus. As we come to the table, we recognize that on a hill far away, an old rugged cross stood. It was the emblem of suffering and shame. It was on that cross that our sins were taken. It was on that cross that Jesus died, the death that we should have died. And so this morning, God, we cherish the cross. We cherish the work that you've done. And we say thank you. We love you. Let's worship.